we should pick up. So to go to more kind of uh, specific questions, I think on Paris we already at least talked about a few issues. Alejandro, I, you know, one of the things I wanted to, I mean, the elephant in the room in a sense, you know, when we use governance, we kind of flatten it. For me, I think in Medellin, if any case, the question of patronage, which is maybe an old model, kind of surfaces. Uh, because uh, I think you, I, I think the case of Medellin was a fantastic alignment between professional capacity, that is, people like Alejandro and many others, but also political patronage, and patronage almost in the classical sense. Uh, and that partnership is what sort of uh, created an amazing chemistry. So, you know, I'll go around, but I'd like you to comment a little bit on that and share with us uh, the kind of importance uh, of, of that aspect. And what was very particular about Medellin? Thank you, Rahul. So, uh, like any other city, the history of Medellin is complex. Yes. <laughs> and I was telling you a beautiful, a beautiful history. Yes. <laughs> And there are different layers of that. That's right. but, but it's true that um, you, you need to understand the process. And I completely agree with you about the artifact. So it's not possible to, to understand or to use the, I don't like the, the, the word model. And it, because behind all the, those processes and projects, there are a lot of partnerships, a lot of uh, histories, and uh, that bring them dif different sustainability. Could look the same, but happens differently if you test after 15 years. So the, ro the robust agenda and the number of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, institutions, uh, local leaders, organizations that found the process is very important of that. And, and I agree with you that, that um, the politics change the perception and the confidence in some way of the, of the environment and the moment of the city. But to understand that, you, you must understand the level of the crisis that we had. Because always the people ask, so how to start the process, how to move politics, how to change politicians, how to develop a different sensibility. And, it's not good to say, but the crisis helped help us a lot and to turn it around. So there are many things to, to talk about it. And of course, it's a fragile process. It's not ideal, and we still have uh, huge challenges. But, but uh, persons are important as well. So some leaders are very important. Yeah. And that sort of also results in a particular set of protocols that you kind of develop. And I think just to pick up on that, in the case of Kigali, you know, I was struck that you, in your presentation, you move between master plan and strategic plan kind of sort of interchangeably. To me, that they mean completely different things. And so I was sort of curious to, to ask you when you were describing that master plan, what is, what is the form that takes uh, uh, in terms of a format, uh, is, it a, is it a static plan because that's what you need to do politically or is the stra strategic plan uh, a much more a kind of listing and inventory of values that you somehow build consensus on? I wasn't clear from the presentation, so I just thought if you could elaborate on that, please. Well, yes, and that was by design, by the way. Um, I did not want to talk about the master plan uh, again. I, I, can, I can reiterate it. So the... the the, 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 I think the master plan was not the right tool to do what the governance of the country was trying to do. But there was no available, uh, close uh, available tool to help do the, what the country is trying to do. That's why I'm saying I have my own um, criticism of what that master plan looks like now and how it's presented, what it's talked about. But I think the, it has some components of it that answers some of the strategic planning that we're talking about that was intentionally put there because uh, that's how um, the, the country decided or wanted it to be. Um, on, a, on a resident uh, level, uh, I strongly believe that the physical spaces that we occupy um, kind of are the physical manifestations of systems that run of our societies. And I think uh, trying to understand our, our cities in that sense, uh, you can understand that Kigali, the way it is at the moment, is reflecting 
all the efforts, at least that's what we are trying to do to reflect all the efforts that the country has been trying to instill when they talk about the new Rwanda, the new uh, political values, the, uh, the trying to understand how we change our justice system, for instance, to deal with the problems we've had in the past, or uh, trying to uh, recreate um, this sense of, uh, in, in Rwanda we call it agachiro, is dignity of the person. What does that mean in Rwandan terms? And, and therefore, trying to get those back into the fabric of the city mm -hmm. is very challenging at the moment because the city physically as it's built is, again, come from the colonial time where uh, all the cities people have described here come from that area. The same problems those cities have, we have those, those problems. There's a mentality also of the model that we're talking about where there's an aspiration. Tigari should be like Singapore. Tigari should be like... Um, I don't know, uh, Guangzhou or Beijing or Shanghai. Again, that is like a thing that we, not, we, we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot uh, ignore. And then there is also the economics and finances where, like you say, yeah, developers are there to make money and therefore they're pushing the doors of the decision makers and try to, to, to do this thing. So I think that, um, that search for the right answer, the right solution, is something that is started now in the city of Tigari, but I only see it succeed, succeed if we keep consistent at iterating at it, mm -hmm. and when this new generation kind of takes it over and understand it well and implement it in the right way. Mm -hmm. Yes, no, and I think that became clear because you were talking about constructing a new identity, but not using architecture as the central instrument to organize it, which is what often happens. From principles, we jump to architecture as the instrument uh, to organize cities. And I think in the case of Seoul, uh, I think you described the protocols historically uh, uh, until the colonization that created a culture of planning. But then I was struck by the jump to the architectural project, as you kind of rightly pointed out. Uh, and, uh, and then furthermore, you said now the shift is to these multifarious, smaller projects, polycentric, disaggregated. Mm -hmm. uh, my question would be, is there much discussion about the tissue or let's say urban design in a very broad way that connects it all? Uh, because I find there's a massive jump between the bureaucracy, its protocols, those planning instruments you described, and then the artifact uh, in Seoul. So that's the, the constant uh, tension between the bureaucratic system that is, that is primarily there for maintenance and regulation. So the bureaucratic system doesn't really effect change. It sort of uh, regulates capital, and I think that's a good thing. I mean, you, you, you do need, from my ideological perspective, you do need to be able to control capital to a certain degree. Uh, so, so how do you to respond to global changes, to, to changes within the society? And that is, uh, one way is through these projects. And the nature of the projects, of course, change. And so uh, there are uh, 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 discussions at multi-level scales. And so the larger scale right now is this global uh, possibility of a connected Korean Peninsula, which will change the economy of the whole region. And so there's that level and how uh, architectural urban design responds to that. And it's a very uh, difficult discussion because we don't know what North Korea is. You know, it's, it's one of a unique kind of situation. And then, of course, within Seoul, uh, within the more micro scale levels, it's, it's, it's a kind of uh, a debate within architectural and urban planning communities of how to deal with micro scale and, and one of the great discoveries is that we really don't know um, at the micro scale level of the economic uh, mechanisms. And so that's something that I think every city really has to, to work with. There are global forces, but at the same time, there's a lot of work to do on the ground because we really don't know how the global economy actually works within micro scales. And I think that's from my perspective is the crux of of architectural intervention. And in your case, the tension is greater just because it is a centralized bureaucracy. It is, it is still centralized. Yes. Though we say we're being <laughs> horizontal, but compared to, yeah. to yeah. Other, other societies, yes. we're still very centralized. It's still a very bureaucratic system. Right. 
Professor, I don't know your city well, but there are three things that came to mind which I would be curious to know how you're trying to reconcile. One was, I think these are the three forces that you seem to be dealing with. One is, I would call it the tyranny of images, uh, because you're beginning to metamorphose you know, into something else, uh, and there's a clear pressure to do that. Uh, uh, and this tyranny of images is, uh, I mean, I think you alluded to that too, be like Singapore, and then some small town wants to be like another small town that has copied Singapore, et cetera. The other was that uh, I think you're, the interventions that you're facing with the fabric being ripped with what I would call monofunctional infrastructure, and I would think clover leaves and flyovers. This has been a disaster in cities as part of the development paradigm, which is monofunctional infrastructure that actually completely destroys any sense of the city, and it's, it connects a few people, but not really. And the third question was that you, you yourself bought conservation. And you know, I mean, we deal with this in India and many parts of the world where when the, when the custodians of that artifact are a different culture from the creators, because in a, in a post-colonial situation, that's exactly what happens, you've got to completely construct new narratives in a way to engage people uh, in terms of what even that means, uh, because otherwise it's a, it's a, it's a colonial stigma uh, in a sense. And so I thought these were three challenges that clearly you're dealing with, and I'd just be curious to know on what kinds of questions come up. Yeah, yeah yes. Uh, well, the tyranny of images, I think uh, we all live uh, in Africa. We are all experiencing in Africa. Uh, it's, it's also this urge to to do away with what is, uh, to, to, to get away from what is uh, traditional, what is uh, considered as slum, uh, because all this is, is, is just brought in as something which is backward, full of poverty, informality, and so on. But uh, within this, as I'm trying to illustrate, there is a lot of, uh, um, a lot of activity, a lot of uh, public life, there is a lot of uh, ingenuity. And uh, the, the biggest thing is, of course, the, 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 the multi-layered uh, life, you know, the, the production, the, pub, the social life, the cultural social life, and so on, which uh, cannot be easily duplicated or replicated, but there is uh, a lot of uh, lessons to be learned from there. And we are still not able to, uh, to generate an urban design which actually accommodates this. Because as you mentioned, everything that we do, when we do housing, it ends up being a monofunctional thing. It's, it's just residences and so on. And all the other things, even though we try, it's uh, the, 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 the very messy, but multi-layered uh, wells of, of uh, human life that you find in these areas cannot be easily replicated. So is the solution reading this, you know, completely erasing with tabula rasa these, these areas and creating new housing? Or would it not be better to work with this and develop it into something which is more sustainable? Which brings me to the question of conservation. We actually came to this through our study of urban conservation. Uh, usually when we talk about conservation in the, in the first world, in the developed world, it might be also of looking at very good historic buildings and so on, but not, you know, we, we, we lose what is the intangible, what is the social cohesion and so on. And I think there is a big potential in the, in the public, in the lower strata of the society to empower it and bring something out of that instead of just putting the top-down approach. I think it, ca it has to go both ways, top-down, bottom-up. Great. Um, I think we'd like to open this up a little more now, if we can. And in opening it up, can I be very blunt and say it would be really nice to have some people speaking who self-defined as women, um, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> so please volunteer yourselves. Um, but in making your, your comments and reflections and questions, please would you introduce yourselves, tell us where you're from, and bear in mind that what we welcome now, and uh, Ro will look up and make sure we do get representations from around the room, uh, what we're looking for are summative comments, critical comments, 
disruptive comments. Uh, they, we won't take individual questions. We will try and leave some time to wrap up uh, at the end. But we will, and you may want to bounce off each other. Um, in other words, everything doesn't have to come back uh, to the so-called high table. Uh, so if you could indicate, um, preference will be given to people who haven't spoken before. People of a kind. Uh, my name is Devin Brookins, and um, I'm working on a trans, uh, transforming urban governance, uh, transformative uh, urban transport project um, that focuses on the, the governance aspect. And we're doing a new pilot in uh, sub-Saharan African cities. Um, my question for you, for the, the table, and this is particularly for the speaker um, from Seoul, you mentioned that bureaucratic systems are for maintenance and regulation, and they play a role in controlling capital. I guess this is a bit of a comment, actually. Um, it seems like uh, basically governing forces are actually meant to enable capital in the current paradigm rather than control capital. And um, some of the, the conversations here about the images that we see are really sort of a race to the bottom, a competition of, of African capital and primate cities to try to enter into the global economy. Um, so I was wondering if you could comment about this sort of distinction between um, this controlling force versus enabling force when it comes to the, the role that capital plays. Thank you. I think this will be also part of my closing comment. And I think that, that there really needs to be a kind of long-term vision about how we create uh, new forms of, of economies, I think. And, and I think the central issue here is, is a sustainable economy that, that, uh, that just, it's not just follows the old modernist forms of, of job uh, creation, of employment, and so you have a manufacturing sector and then you have a service sector. We know that the, the global economy and, and there is a serious crisis of capitalism despite of, <laughs> Of, uh, of this dominant force of, of um, global capitalism. And so I think that the answer would not just be between enabling and regulating, that, that there needs to be a kind of practical vision, uh, not only at the national level, but at the uh, municipal level, of, of seeing a new form of economy that will eventually come. I think the, the climate change and and uh, the crisis of capitalism at the global level will require us for new forms of the relation between uh, what we think was capitalism and what we thought was uh, sort of governance at the public sector. And so new forms of, of uh, uh, economy, basic income systems, uh, economic uh, mechanisms that fit the specific culture of the, of the community, of, of each different African city, of Asian cities, that seems to be the kind of imagination that we are all trying to pursue. So, so I wouldn't sort of divide that. I think in reality, each, uh, each society with their own mechanisms have different ways to control it at this moment. And um, so, so enabling and controlling is, I think, two sides of the same sort, but when you when you wield that sword, you have to have that kind of, uh, of practical vision of a new form of society because unless we, we have that, I think we're sort of like, as, as the term goes, we're doomed. <laughs> so we do need a new kind of vision. I'm Hilma von Lojewski from the German Association of Cities. I'm the elderman uh, looking after urban development. I think we all know that the planning fundamentals are determined by the land market fundamentals. And... Uh, at least in the seven German metropolitan areas, we try to either suspend or dim these mechanisms. And I'd like to know from the panelists what your experience is with the land market mechanisms and what your answers are. The second is informal informality in urban development is something which appears also in Germany. And we have a lot of lessons to learn from all of you. Um, don't we need formal planning for more informality is a question which puzzles us in Germany. What do you think? Uh, I'm Patrick Lamson Hall from New York University. Um, I have a question that has to do with the power and omnipotence of planners. I think um, plans are often not implemented, uh, even in the event that we're able to create a plan that actually seems reasonable. 
oftentimes it stays on paper and there's a disconnect between the planning process and the implementation process. Um, how do we address that? What are the causes of it? And how seriously should we, should we take that as an issue? My, my name is Marco Di Nunzio. I'm an anthropologist at the University of Birmingham. Sorry, I'm reading from my laptop because I'm quite, I'm not used to talk to a big audience. So uh, we are hearing now about public spaces, art installations, pedestrian areas, zebra crossings, green areas, heritage sites, and so on, and how planning uh, promotes space of pro spatial, spatial proximity. But my question is, are we actually pursuing a certain aesthetics of inclusion, imagining how inclusion might um, look like spatially against corporate geographies and aesthetics of, of capital? But at the same time, are we actually giving up on thinking how architectural interventions can deliver uh, on a social and economic uh, level entirely? Or we are simply assuming that architectural interventions and aesthetics will trickle down in terms of social and economic opportunities. So if you have experience of that, can you please share with the audience how aesthetics of inclusion trickle down in uh, social and economic uh, forms of inclusion and empowerment? I'm Edith from Berlin, and I conduct research on local democracy and participation. And we have heard a lot of comments about the future development of a lot of different cities with a very different set of characteristics, I would say. Um, and it was mentioned that the identity of the people living in that city is very important, but something that I have been missing that is very... Yeah, it's a, it's a very big topic in Germany at the moment. Uh, it's the topic of participation of people <coughs> in the city. Um, and it's something that is very important Well, there's one about, well, implementation, one on land markets and what we can learn from informality, the aesthetics of inclusion and what that might mean, uh, and the last question, which is fresh in everyone's mind, participation. Uh, may I? Yeah. Talking about informality and the necessity for formal process and planning, I was, I was remembering the yesterday when we were crossing the Mercato and my mind was doing a lot of numbers in relation with the economy what, and the processes that happens there. So the, the, the challenge is that I think we must to understand the processes not to kill them, how to develop plans that permit those ecosystems to improve, maybe in, with new, new conceptions, more thinking in transitions, in uh, hybrid conditions, not in a frozen images. So we, we, need, we need, I think, a different paradigm and more modesty as well. Because at the same time, is, is my point of view, it's, com <coughs> it's, it's completely impossible to uh, anticipate some situation that is happening in Latin America and in Africa. So to be strategic and where to act is important. So this, from my point of view, this is the, the problem of the traditional planning approach. And uh, I strongly believe that in our context, that because the fragility, the lack of continuity, the corruption, <laughs> and you, you, you will be more effective thinking in mid-scale and small-scale actions that belongs to a bigger ideas, a systemic, a systemic principles, more like a viral actions, I'm not th saying that it's going to be the, uh, the, the solution, but it will be more effective of that. It's difficult to, to answer all this, uh, uh, this question. Uh, I, I will begin uh, with uh, uh, one uh, idea I think is uh, important. It's about the relationship between public space and, uh, and private space. Uh, I think that uh, in, in all cities, uh, public space uh, must govern uh, uh, the, the private space. Uh, uh, in a city, uh, the emptiness must drive uh, fullness. I mean that uh, we don't. Ha we must have the, the, the planification, the, the planning in mind by designing first 
the public space, the parks, the streets, uh, the squares, uh, and so on, because uh, it's the, the place where people are connecting together. And uh, this is uh, why it's so important to uh, involve uh, uh, the private sector and uh, uh, mainly the developers and, 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 and of course, uh, the financial sector uh, in global projects, what, what I've called a uh, uh, private project of general interest. They have to produce public space. They have to produce amenities. Producing cities' amenities, it's not the monopoly of uh, the uh, local government. It has to be a shared goal between all the stakeholders uh, in order to, uh, uh, to work together in the same, uh, uh, in the same direction. Uh, for example, uh, and it's, maybe it's a recommendation I can make to uh, 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 my friends from uh, 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 cities of developing countries. Uh, you have to put the pedestrian and the biker at the center of the mobility planning uh, uh, system. Uh, and it means that, for example, building uh, uh, urban highways is a big mistake in every city in the world. And we have made this mistake in Paris. It's a lot of work to go uh, uh, and undo it. So don't do this mistake, because you can learn of our mistakes. And uh, this is maybe the biggest mistakes. I've begun my presentation with uh, a, a, a picture of the ring road. And maybe the ring road is the biggest mistakes uh, that have been done in, uh, in the middle uh, of, the, uh, of the 20th century. And it's a challenge for us. And it will take maybe 30 years to get rid of, of this uh, uh, highway and to transform it into uh, 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 urban, uh, urban boulevard. Another uh, question, I think, is not to make a confusion between uh, density and uh, uh, eye building and skyscrapers. For example, Paris is one of the densest cities in the world. We don't have skyscrapers. So thanks to Mr. Osman. Uh, 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 and, uh, uh, and it's possible to have density without skyscrapers. And you can have a livable city, sometimes a livable city, is a city without uh, skyscrapers. And the competition between cities on the highness of the buildings is a stupid uh, competition. And you, you have to forget it. You have to forget it. And another recommendation, and maybe it's related with the question of aesthetics. Uh, I was in the north of uh, uh, Ethiopia uh, the last days. And uh, it was uh, heartbreaking to see all these bu new buildings built with concrete, uh, and all these old buildings in wood and uh, in, uh, in uh, stone. And it's, it's a paradox, it's ironic, that in Paris, we are going exactly in the other direction. We are abandoning concrete uh, uh, to use biosourced materials like wood, like, like uh, 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 stone, like terracotta. And in these wonderful cities, which have the habit and the knowledge to use these uh, traditional materials, you use concrete, it's terrible, you know. And you should create uh, a training of all this traditional uh, 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 knowledge and make young people know, knowing how to build these buildings uh, in the traditional way. And this is maybe uh, the DNA of cities uh, uh, like uh, uh, African cities. And, uh, uh, and maybe this is the new aesthetic uh, of, the, of the future uh, African city. I think, Jean-Louis, I can't agree more. <laughs> yeah, uh, we, uh, we as late comers, we have the chance to learn, but uh, we seem to be not learning because we associate these things that you said with poverty, backwardness, and so on, which is a pity, but I think practice will, will show us that we should go elsewhere. But do we have the tools, is the question, for the planning, implementing the planning? Do we really have the, the tools to understand this, interpret it, and bring it to, because all our education is based 
on the Western models of how to do planning. So we really have to rethink, relearn, and so on. And I would say, start from where, what is there. Learn what is there. I think we, we, we cannot read, we are not, we are almost blind in understanding this, and we need to rework backwards and find these lessons. Uh, that's what I want to say, thank you. I'll just make a couple of quick comments and then Susan, you would close. Uh, you know, I think just the aesthetic question, I think we've addressed the question of implementation in many ways, it's a difficult one. But I think the set, going back again to that idea of the incomplete city, of, 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 of pl pluralism, of, of, of bizarre adjacencies being able to coexist. And then the task of the designer and the planner really becomes how do you facilitate those connections to make them work? Difference we must accept, because otherwise we are getting very you know, the absolute solutions in terms of complete images. So I mean, I think that is something worth discussing. Discussing. I just wanted to put two uh, issues on the table, and I hope it'll be picked up uh, tomorrow in the housing session and uh, uh, otherwise. One is, you know, we have to also caution ourselves of not uh, treating cities as closed systems. I think a lot of the discussion has that implication. Cities developed to distribute surplus from the hinterland. There were mechanisms to distribute that surplus. They got wealthy, and then they had merchants who lived there, and now you have services, and it's becoming. But yet, the extraction, the resources come often from the hinterland. And this connection, I think we've got to bring back on the table to have any uh, relevant discussion about planning. And as an extension from that is the question of housing. We have a whole session on that. Actually, in any city, 75% of the fabric is housing. Yet, planning tends to focus naturally on the public space because that is the common space. Those are the commons. Uh, but I think this, this, this juncture is becoming very severe in the culture of planning today. Uh, and I think we've got to re connect housing, which means repair, which means upgradation, it means how do you make. Uh, informal, auto-constructed, there are many words being thrown around uh, these days and hopefully we'll pick it up, but how do you make all that happen within the imagination of planning, not outside it? So thank you. So. Interesting, I think, if we reflect that we have, I think, n not divided planning and design. Um, and for me, that's a very significant step. The second thing I think it, which is really marked about our conversation is that we have not contested that there is a role for experts, but we have contested what experts do, how they think, and how they might be held accountable in the city, whether it's on whether they should be building uh, at ring roads or not, or any number of those things. And I leave you with two, I think, provocative ideas, the idea of kind of how do we use an urban crisis uh, in productive ways, because almost all of the cities that we've talked about have had those where they've provoked us and whether it's a crisis born of growth, a political crisis, uh, or some other form of, of, of crisis, how do we begin to respond in ways where we are able to trigger large-scale institutional changes in what we think and do uh, in our cities, and hopefully in ways that uh, get to a little bit more than trickle down by design? Um, and with that, I leave you with tea. <laughs> Thank you.